here. But I just took a peep into my life. That's the kind of music I listen to. I like noise. I listen to a lot of rock music. You know. Joshua has been in my church. He knows that we, we make a lot of noise because we discovered that my brother too has been in our church. We discovered that heaven is a very noisy place. And if you go to a stadium, you realize that the winning side is always the shouting side. You know, if you look at the other side and they're just, they're losing. Praise God. So that's what we started talking about yesterday. But before I go into that this morning, thank you so much for the scripture you read. You know, in Ephesians 4, that's the heart. In Matthew 16, Jesus spoke of his intention in response to what Peter said. Jesus Christ, like I said yesterday, will not ask questions because he doesn't know. He asks questions so that you might know. He said, who do men say that I am? And they were, you know, saying... You're Jeremiah, you know, you're one of the prophets. You're this, you're that. And then he now directed the question to them. Is that clear enough for everybody? He directed the question to them and said, Who do you now say that I am? And Peter got a wind. He got a fax copy of Heaven's Meeting. You know, they sent him an email. <laughs> and he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Not a Christ. He is the Christ. Now that Christ today, the intention is he's going to be Christ's. In Obadiah, he said they are going to be saviors, plural, in Zion. Because you are saved to be a savior. Now he said, now Peter, heaven revealed this to you. You got an email from heaven. And said, upon this rock, he wasn't talking about Peter. Because Peter's name means a stone. Right? But Peter make it, you know, he made a statement that Jesus Christ called what? A rock. He said, you are Peter. You are a stone. Right? But upon this rock, the Catholics thought Jesus was talking about Peter. So they built the, you know, the basilica in Rome on the tomb of Peter. So because Jesus Christ is going to build the church upon Peter. They missed it big time. Now he said, it was the statement that Peter made. He said, Peter, you have made an enigmatic statement. Upon this rock, which rock? That Christ is the son of the living God. That Jesus is the Christ, the son that is the offspring of the living God. He said, it's on that statement, on that revelation, that I'm going to build my church. Now, the word church, that is the word ecclesia, which you're very familiar with in Hausa language. It means a called out people. A people set apart. It's the same word that you use for saint or sanctified. It means to set apart. He said, upon that statement, that is what I'm going to use, right? To build this, my called out ones. Are you with me? Now, you now go to Ephesians. I like the way you read it because people normally start from verse 11, but you started from where we should start from. That when he ascended, he gave gifts to men. Now, those gifts, listen, they are not titles. They are functionings. They are offices. Those gifts... They started out as offices, but they became men. So they are not titles. You can't call yourself prophet dot or apostle something. It is Joshua the apostle. Not apostle Joshua. It's not a title. Are you with me? You never see apostle Paul in the Bible. It's Paul who functions in the office, right? Of an apostle jeremiah the prophet micaiah the prophet 
And he said, these, you know, those five ministries, they are Christ broken down into five. Christ is the apostle. Christ is the prophet. Christ is the evangelist. Time won't permit me to give you the instances where he, he you know, he actually, Bible, Hebrews call him the apostle of our confession. In Luke 8, quoting from the book of Isaiah, he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me to preach. He is the evangelist. They call him teacher. He is the prophet. Right? He's the prophet that came after John. John is the last prophet of the Old Testament. And John paved the way for the prophet to come. And he's the shepherd, the pastor. So those five ministries, they are actually Christ manifesting in different ways. And their function is this. There are no two other functions. It is to equip. King James put it, to perfect. To equip, to perfect. is a Greek word, katatismos, where you get the word artisan. The one who make up for what is missing. He covers the crevices. They make that man whole so that the man can function. And there's something we call in theology, the, the, you know, the fatal comma. That scripture says that to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry. Where you put the comma might change the whole meaning. Right? If you say that he gave them those gifts to perfect the saints, I mean, you know, you are actually saying that these apostles, prophet, teacher, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, they are the ones doing the work of the ministry. No. It is the saints that carries out the work of the ministry as prepared and equipped by these officers. That's what we're here to do. You see, God, Joshua is saying that he's kindling a fire here that is going to become a bonfire. He says it's going to start in such a way that when you light a match, you keep it from the wind. Right? But if you can get dry wood together, and that fire touches the wood, you now need the wind. You now need the wind. That's what he's doing here. He's kindling a fire here. And you see, wood in scripture is always symbolic of humans. That guy who got his side, he said, I see men walking as trees. Right? When Bezalel and Aholiab were, you know, constructing the tabernacle, they came with wood and they washed it thoroughly. So God wants to wash you thoroughly this morning. You know why? He wants to build gold into you. Gold is symbolic of divinity. Wood is, is symbolic of humanity. But by the time you finish that work, you no longer see wood. You see only gold. But there's still humanity there. But totally overwhelmed by gold. So God saying in Psalm 102, turn there with me before I start on this morning. I'm a teacher, I take nothing for granted. I teach as if you don't know anything. But I know you know something. This place is so clear. There's grace to preach. Hallelujah. There are many places you go, you have to dig and dig and dig and dig. Thank you, Joshua, for the work you're doing. 102 from 16. Pentecost has liked to read it from 13. You will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. Yes, the set time has come. Blah, 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 blah. But I love 15. The nations shall fear the name of the Lord. I love for the nations to fear. Right? You know the fear? <laughs> That's the way people... It's not because in the book of... Is it my, my cue is always from the church in the book of Acts. It's not an all-commerce affair. So people were afraid to come to church. That's the kind of church we begin to see when you guys get this thing. He said the nations will fear. Are you with me? All the kings of the earth, they will respect your glory. Why? Because the Lord shall build up Zion. 
That's when they will fear. He shall appear in his glory. Then he shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. You see, you are really nothing now, but you are going to become something. <laughs> now, these words are directed to a particular kind of people. Next verse. These are written for the generation to come. Say, I belong to that generation. A people yet to be created. I just stop there. Because if you read it on and on, by the time those people are created, then the Lord will reign in Zion. You see, the world has had the message. But the world is yet to see the message. TBN is everywhere. God channel is everywhere. The world has had the message. But they are yet to what? To see the message. The message must become touchable. That's what we find in John 1.14. He said the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And then what? We beheld his glory. He said no man, John 1.18, has seen God at any time. But the only begotten, he has what? He has revealed him. God is looking for those who will reveal him. I love the message Bible of John 1.14. He said the world became a human being and moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> he moved next door. We go to the same market. We buy from the same shopping mall. The world became a human being. And did what? He moved into my street. Now that's what they should be saying about you. I told a story recently in church about an American who, who had a contact with a man from the Middle East, a nation called Armenia. Armenians are, are Orthodox Christians. You know, they are direct descendants of Abraham. And this American asked this guy, are you a Christian? And the man said, no, I can't tell you whether I am or not, but go and ask my neighbor. He said, go and ask my neighbor whether I'm a Christian. It doesn't really matter what we say in church. What's the world saying about us? You see, power, authority, dominion, strength, wisdom, everything that is God must return to church. Right now, church is man-centered, entertainment-based, need-oriented. But that's not kingdom. In a kingdom, only one interest reigns. And that's the king's. The earth is the Lord's. The fullness thereof. And everything that dwells in it. There is a generation to come. That yet to be created. Hallelujah. I look for a way to summarize all the things I said yesterday. And this is the way I can summarize it. That we need to know how to move with God as he shifts emphasis in the spirit. We are quick to camp. When Peter, James, and John were taken to the Mount of Transfiguration, I like a sense of music. Do you know that that is one key card God is going to use in these last days? Art is one key weapon that God is going to use to turn our world again upside down. You know what? That's what has turned it right side up. Prophesied to a lady in our church. He said, he said, you are beautiful. And it's all part of a big plan. Esther used beauty to wreak havoc in Babylon. God is wise. 
That's why I love him. He leaves nothing to chance. Your beauty is not for guys first, it's for God. <laughs> After God has received it, then he looks for a good guy who can steward that beauty for him. Hallelujah. That's how I can summarize it. Now I said we are in the third day. We've known Jesus as the way. We got saved. We know him as the truth. I don't know the extent to which. We're receiving because truth is a person. Right? Pilate asked, what is truth? He was confused. But truth was standing before him. But right now, we need to take another step into the third dimension. To know him as life. That's why that song, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Because the word worship has nothing to do with the song. The word worship is from two words, worth, ship. So you demonstrate it in a song declaring the worth of God. That's why worship is primarily a lifestyle. It's from two words, worth, ship. So when you are worshiping, it's not necessarily a song. So we've known him as the way. We know him as the life, but he now wants to be known as, I mean, as truth, he now wants to be known as life. Then we can appreciate what Paul wrote to the guys in Athens, in the book of Acts. It is in him we live. It's in him we move. It's in him we have our being. Hallelujah. So yesterday we looked at Job's confusion. He says, since times are not hidden from the Almighty, why do those who know him not see his days? Why do we just keep doing our things and we have camped around what God did? We are always quick to camp. I was about telling you Peter, James, and John to the Mount of Transfiguration, right? The first thing Peter said, let's make three turns here. There can't be anything more than this. <laughs> that's, that's always, you know, the way we respond to whatever God does. But that, you see, God is omnipotent, true? Omni means all. Potent means latent power. Your potential is never what you have done, it's what you can do. So whatever God has done is an indication there is more. That's why the angels in heaven keep shouting hallelujah. Holy, holy. When they finish saying that, appreciating one thing they've seen of God, he reveals himself again. And they say, my goodness, holy, holy. He reveals himself. That's why it's perpetual. That's why you see the Jews, what they used to represent the word of God is a scroll. It keeps on folding. It keeps on folding. It keeps on folding. How dare you get born again and get a flight ticket with boarding pass waiting for rapture? The word rapture never occurred in the Bible. It was just a mere reference. I believe in the rapture. Don't misunderstand me. I believe in it. I know it's... But you see, rapture is much more than an event. It's also a process. The coming of the Lord is not just an event. It's also a process. There is... We are living right now in the days of His coming. The days... That's not 24 hours. It's a season. It's a dispensation. These are the days of his coming. He wants to be seen. He wants to be touched. He wants when you sneeze, is the word of God that is sneezing. When you get angry, God just got angry. Life inseparable from him. Like what happened to David when he was anointed by Samuel. Bible says from that day the spirit of the Lord came upon David. Literal translation. From that day the spirit of God started to conduct the details of David's life. That was the way Jesus lived. Jesus was living out a written script. He can't live the way he wants. 
He was a normal Jew, remember? The Jesus would have loved to marry. Yeah, but he couldn't. That's why I'm taking you this morning. You think Jesus didn't like babes in church, in the synagogue? I'll give you scripture. Hebrews 4. He was tempted on all fronts just like you have ever loved anybody. <laughs> have you ever loved to smoke pot? Yes, sir. Smoke yes, sir. Indian hemp sometimes? <laughs> he was tempted on all fronts. Say all fronts. all fronts. Just like you and I, but he was without sin. So he loved babes in church. But there was a higher call that prevented him. I can't do that. Why? There's a higher call. That's the day that we live in. Praise God. So we must become a generation that God, that we present ourselves to God, that he can resource us, that we can declare his day. That we no longer preach just by talking. We just express. Napoleon Bonaparte read the book of John. He said, that guy, must either be writing about himself or about somebody he knows very well. They saw John the Baptist and said, this guy must be the Christ. He had to convince them. That somebody will talk about Christ somewhere, maybe to a little boy. I know this uncle you are talking about. He lives in our street. That's what God wants. But you see, it won't come in an atmosphere that is man-centered, entertainment-based, and need-oriented. That's how I define the church today. Whatever God has finished is our duty to express it. You always see that refrain in the life of Jesus. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. The guy couldn't live any other life. John 4, Bible says he must need go through Samaria. He was going somewhere. He wasn't only the disciples, write less and listen more. Right? If you want a copy of the PowerPoint, I'll drop it. Write less, right? And listen more. Those are just nuggets. Bible says he must need go through Samaria. He was going somewhere. The destination was not the only thing defined. Even how to get there. Any other place could take you through, I mean to Jerusalem. But for you, Jesus, you must go through Samaria. There's a woman there that's been married to six husbands or to five husbands. He's caught in the sixth. You are the seventh husband that she needs to meet. See, you can't just live anyhow. That's not kingdom life. In my life, the kingdom reigns. Amazing song. If you know what that means. You see, God is a puppeteer. Have you ever seen a puppet? The puppet has no voice. It's the puppeteer that speaks. The puppet can't move his hand. It's the puppeteer that moves it. That's the way God is. And we only do it when you allow him. So Paul took it for granted. We must know the times and seasons. I shared that yesterday. The question we should be asking right now, where is God? I want to be where he is. I want to do what he's doing. I want to say what he's saying. I want to be his echo. I want to establish his structure. When he taught us to pray, he said, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth in exactly the same manner as it's done in heaven. If you are a scholar, you ask, how is his will done in heaven? That's the question you ask. Right? How is his will done? Because if you just read down and it's a memory verse, you lose it. You lose the juice of it. He 
his will is done in heaven there is no other will in heaven when satan said i will he was kicked out and the bible said there was no place found for him and god said let's play a game here let's kick him to earth right let's kick him to earth and the guy got to us he said i have not done yet let's put an envoy on the earth that will continue the kicking And you know what he did? He put man here and put himself in that man. Let's continue the kicking. Let's play this game. I think I like this. God is fun loving. Because the enemy got here before Adam got here. And when Adam was created, he said, guard this garden. What does that say? There is an intruder around. We started this game in heaven. We were kicking him around. There was no place found. That's why Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, give no spot give no place the word place or spot there is a greek word topos where you get the word topography right that is give no space for the guy when he comes to your life you kick him he comes there you kick him there is no that's why the guy is wondering i'm going to and fro you know seeking who i'm a devour that's why i don't talk about the devil he doesn't come in my gospel right no he can't take my attention it's a defeated foe right he said the devil did the devil what did he do there is nothing the devil can do in your life without your permission can i also tell you there's nothing god can do without your permission that's why we're going this morning where is god what is the agenda of the third day because it's a one item agenda to perfect the saints so that they can do the work of the ministry the agenda is to fix heaven's envoy on earth the greatest challenge we have on the face of the earth today is defective humans malfunctioning human beings the problem in nigeria is not whether we have democracy or militocracy or you know whatever that's not it is not the system of government it is the people that operates the system if i my favorite is military it gets things done quickly it's cheaper there's no state assemblies Right? Military is the closest to God. <clears throat> Imagine if we have to go and pass a bill in National Assembly before Jesus will come. We'll still be waiting. Because we go through first reading, second reading. You know, everybody will speak grammar. They say, okay, if it's going to part his blood, what kind of blood? A plus, A, A, or whatever. Okay, if he's going to die on the cross, hmm, we need a very strong race. Maybe a black man. Because blacks, they've always been suffering. So the, the, the dialogue, the debate, but God knows what's good for you because he created, and he does it without consulting you. So today, what is a one-item agenda? You are God's envoy on the face of the earth. And heavens want to fix you. So that his kingdom can come. His will can be done. Just exactly as it is done in heaven. The primary infrastructure we need in Nigeria is not road. It's not electricity. It's humans. When accurate humans begin to get to places of influence. Piece of cake. If the gen in my house can walk all the time. We can have power 24 7 in nigeria when i travel out of this country and i see that power don't go i don't see two-headed men running the show they are still humans right where things work is because humans function well 
It is malfunctioning humans that's our problem. And the factory that God has said to produce these people, they are distracted. That's the church. That's how we describe our church. Our church is a factory where accurate lives are produced. It's a factory. And when you come to church because it's a factory, absolute submission. Never go to a church that you can't receive the pastor as God. You want me to say that again? Never go to a church that you cannot receive the pastor as God. You take his word for it. If he's worthy of being your pastor, the one who speaks the word of God to you, receive him as God. But we live in the 21st century where everybody thinks. When the Bible says, take no thought, think my thoughts. Is if one died for all, First Corinthians five, or second? Is it second? Second. Then all died, and this is how we reckon. If one died for all, then those who now live should no longer live unto themselves, but unto Him that died. You see, these are things we have forgotten. When you come to church, you submit every of your faculty. That's why I was careful to say we have received Him as truth. The only one we know is the way because of what he promises. We're going to heaven. Not knowing that heaven is not meant for human beings. Yeah. Read Hebrews 11, the last chapter. I mean the last verse. Those who are in heaven are not happy. They're waiting for you. He said they can't finish the journey apart from you. Will you, will you promise yourself, not me, that you will go back to the Bible? Because for ma many of us, we have believed the lie. That's what happened to me that I had to go through all those transitions. Because I was really desperately searching for God. Then I got to a point where God said, you don't search for me. But because I see your heart, I'm going to chase you. I'm not a God chaser. I'm a man God is chasing. And I don't know how, how I'm going to run. I take 20,000 steps. He just does this. I'm under arrest. I'm a man hunted. I'm a marked man. I can't keep malice. I can't hate Muslims. I'm not permitted. It's not what I like. It's what he wants. Hallelujah. Heaven's agenda. Is to fix his envoy. Why? Because this envoy is needed. Why fix the envoy? Let's move on here. You see, I like PowerPoint because it arrests you, right? And my animations are deliberate. There's a need. That's why we need to fix the envoy. There's, who is an envoy? Huh? Who is an envoy? Talk to me. Who is an envoy? A representative in another realm. Right? The high commissioner of Britain or America to Nigeria can't speak of himself. Right? He can only speak what I'm, he protects he doesn't care what happens to nigeria as long as the interest of his home country right is protected and is the only connection between america or britain or whatever to that place where he stays it will be terrible if the american envoy in nigeria his prayer point is to get a visa back to the america If you ask him, what is your mission in life? To get back to America. Then that man is mad. That's why a lot of Christians are crazy. They want to go to heaven. Heaven is a gift. You don't need a visa. I'm talking to Christians. You can't work enough for it. It's given. But you know what? You can choose not to go. Yeah. 
The American envoy here can say, okay, I'm not going back home again. Right? He can pick Nigerian accent. He can begin to, he can throw away his passport to River Niger or whatever. He said, I want to stay here. That's what, that's another extreme. But you see, right now, what heaven wants is for the envoy to be fixed. Because heaven wants to engage earth. I was following your Facebook. I was misquoted. I said, the proof that you know God today is that you know the world, not word. You need to get to know where God has sent you to. When Jesus came here, he spoke our language. He ate our food. He wore the clothes we wear. He had the neighbor, right? We have to get to know this world because God still so loved the world and is looking for begotten sons to give. So that his will, because God's intention is to make the earth, the world, you know, like a colony of heaven. He wants his will done here. God is the first colonial master. Are you guys following me? So you, you, today, Joshua, we can't disciple the way we've always been. Disciple today has to be intentional. It has to be deliberate. It has to be talent-centered, gift-oriented. What is this? You can't disciple a musician the same way you disciple a lawyer. Are you with me? You can't. The training that a, that a musician needs is different. And that's really where my heart is. I mentor musicians. Because I spend most of my life in the world as a DJ. So I know the power of music. Our musicians today, they are still malfunctioning. They are still doing devotional songs. What do you think will make you listen to Fela's music and you pick his lifestyle? How many listen to our songs and they pick our lifestyles? Fela was given. Michael Jackson was given. How many of you know Jay-Z? Imagine me going to a nightclub and I ask them, do you guys know Don Moy? Do you think they'll know him? Huh? Very unlikely. I'm talking about hardcore night crawlers. They won't know him. We know Jay-Z in church. They don't know Don Moen in the world. Something is wrong. Jay-Z has been able to cross over. We can't cross there because we're singing in church. We must begin to craft music that can cross over. People come when they hear me talk to musicians and they say, Pastor, this is my CD. Once I look at it, Almighty God, I put it in my drawer. I don't listen to those trash. You're telling me what I know. It's badly produced. The guy wants money. He wants fame. His success is, 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 is being played on radio. Who listens? I told him, I said, how I wish somebody, a musician in Joss, we just wax a Christian, we just wax a CD, wailing over Joss. Just wail. Just cry. Just groan. That's a universal language. Because the crisis in just at first the atheist, at first the Muslim, at first the Christian, at first the devil himself, <laughs> at first everybody. We must begin to... You see, we've not seen art. God is an artist. This is why we need church to be reconfigured. Our configuration is totally wrong. It can't produce what God intended. And whenever what is available, listen, this is, a, this is a principle of transformation. Whenever what is available cannot produce what is needed, there is a need for an upgrade. Are you guys with me? We need to learn the rules of engagement. Right? 
That's why in our church we show movies. We have movie nights. Right? And the movies are not necessarily Christian movies. Because there's nothing called Christian music. It's the height of ignorance. There's nothing like that. You can't be a Christian artist. You're limited. You're an artist. And we're taking it to a whole new embarrassing of a Christian lawyer. Go and quote Bible in court. Whether you win. By right, lawyer, you know the ropes, right? Joshua, this is what we need to do. We need to compartmentalize the church in such a way that everyone, and that's what is going to bring us to a point where we will be united by force. You are in this place. You have passion for music. Your pastor has seen, has, pas you know, has passion for music. But imagine you are in a church where your pastor doesn't have passion for music. Meanwhile, you are called to that church. He needs another stream to come and train you. You don't have to leave your church. That's why we will need each other. We will be forced to unite. The challenges we face in the world will move us to a point where we will have to unite. But my focus here is fixing this guy. So you see, in the third dimension, this is not a new message. It's as old as God himself. God has always been a God that starts with a seed and it grows and becomes a forest, right? When, whatever God, you see, we must become a generation that can worship God in his extreme form. The third day is a day of extremes. So from creation through redemption to the restoration of the creative order, that's the summary of, you know, of the Bible. There's a creation that fell, was redeemed, and the purpose of the redemption is to bring creation back to his original order. God wants to see the man that could read his mail again. God brought the animals to Adam. Bible says Adam named them and whatever Adam called them, that was their name. They had names before he brought them to Adam. The name was in the heart of God and Adam saw it. He called the animals whatever God has already called them. Those names were there but never have been voiced. Church should be a place where we gather in the morning, on a Sunday for instance, on a Friday evening, right? And all we are waiting for is a fax copy of the meeting in heaven so that we read it out. But we do our own things. So you see this, this, this third day now, Third day is not a day of talk. Talk is cheap. It's a day of manifestation, of expression. That's why it's a package of values that expresses the completion of God's original intention. The whole of the Bible, God's plan is revealed in Genesis 1 and 2. Everything you see, that's why you see the Bible close with what it began with. Tree of life taken from man, tree of life restored in Revelation 22. Are you guys with me, please? I hope I'm getting across. That's why, you see, it's a third day thing. God is revealed in threefold. Israel's feast, threefold. Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Right? Three feasts. Moses, Tabernacle, outer court, inner court, holy of holies. Jesus is revealed in three fold. Way, truth, life, man, spirit, soul, body. The church has been on body level. Right? Motivational speakers came, they took us to the soulish level. But the ministry that began the church is the one that's going to finish it. The church was founded upon the doctrine of the apostles. It is the apostolic ministry in partnership with the prophetic that is going to finish it. The prophetic burden is to get Christ crafted in people again. Not big grammar. 
the apostle declares it. I mean, the, the prophet de he sees it, declares it. The apostle, you know, manifests it, structures it. Are you guys here? Like I said, my the animations are deliberate. It's a doorway. God is opening a door before you to walk into another dimension. Right? To move from a second day agenda to a third day agenda. So today, guys, we are not just living in the end times. We are living in ultimate times. Ultimate means the most extreme form. So God must be worshipped and related with in the most extreme form. You know why God is allowing evil to befall the earth? So that evil can be seen for what evil is. What you are seeing playing out with Boko Haram, with Al-Qaeda, and all those kind of things is Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Then he says, because darkness is going to cover the earth and gross darkness. Darkness that can be felt. People are getting creative today on how to perpetuate evil. How to carry evil out. They are getting so creative. God is waiting for a generation to enjoy that will be so creative how to express good. Evil is picking up a definite face so that good too, righteousness too, can put up a definite face. So that the truth, because there's going to be a clear distinction. He says in Malachi 3, I'm going to have a clear distinction. You will tell the difference between those who are serving me. In fact, the way Malachi put it is dangerous. It's between my sons who are serving me. That is, there are some sons who are not serving him. This is the day in which God's ultimate intent for man, for, for who is the crown of his creation, will be unveiled. It's Romans 8, 19. The whole of creation, they are standing tiptoed, waiting eagerly for the manifestation, right, of the sons of God. Son, there is not male. It's offspring. It's not a title, it's a description. Nothing to do with gender. Right? He said, This father is not a title, it's a description. Father means source and sustainer. Son is offspring. The whole earth is, is waiting for the one to see what God really looks like. Hosea now throws light on this. Hosea chapter 6. He said, come, let us return to the Lord. Because there was a time we turned. Now let's return to the Lord. He has torn, he's going to heal. He has stricken, he's going to bind up. But look at this. He said, after two days, he will revive us. To revive means it's not to have a loud meeting. To revive means to inject life back into. You don't have a revive. Every time you see the church saying they want revival, they are accepting that we are dead. Right? So if you see a church that always having revival, that means they are dead. God, bring revival. They are saying, God, we are dead. He said, after two days, he said, this is the way Hebrews write. They write their literature language. They are literal. I mean, the way they write is an expression of God's character. God has spoken once, right? Twice have I heard. So they write twice. It's called Hebrew parallelism. You guys are students. I can speak, you know, big English, right? They write twice because after two days and third day means the same thing, right? Every time, exactly when you read the Old Testament, look out for it. Always look out for it. He said, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will resurrect us. Saying the same thing. For what purpose? So that we may live in his sight. Let scripture explain scripture. Second Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord and what happens we are being changed transformed metamorphosed into the same image that we are beholding God wants himself on earth because that was his intention for Adam 
So he said, we need to get away from the face of man. Get away from the face of the world and come into his face. Because you become a reflection of what you reflect upon. What you behold, you become. And in some say, we are going to know. Let us pursue the knowledge of God. The word knowledge. Oh my goodness. You guys can handle Greek? Yes, the word knowledge is a Greek word, epignosis, which means full, complete, and precise knowledge. It's the highest level of intimacy. The word knowledge is actually means sexual intercourse. Adam knew his wife. That's on the handshake. How many of you know good Lord Jonathan? You see his picture. You want to know who really knows him? Patience. That's the way they call it. Patience. <laughs> Patience knows whether he snores. You don't know that. He knows his favorite food. He knows what ticks him on and off. That's knowledge. And every knowledge, you shall know the truth. You will intercourse with the truth. And the truth doesn't say it. Read the original King James. It makes. There's a process involved. Let us pursue intimacy with the Lord. He's going forth. He's established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain and the light, like the latter rain and the former rain and the earth. Hallelujah. This is a time where God wants you guys come here. That's the way I talk to, you know, the young guys in my church. When I see them, my eyes are on you. He wants his eyes on us. Ours on his. Bible says, you see the days, Bible says, my goodness, in the book of Matthew, it said the days of the coming of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah. Right? There will be marriages and you know, what's, what's killing especially girls today is marriage. The only thing girls want in life is PhD, picking husband and degree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry but that's the truth so I'm not sorry <laughs> picking husband and degree <laughs> PhD what a small vision can I talk to you girls because I have I grew up in a girl's hostel and I still live in one. I'm the only man in my house. Wife and three girls. So I live in a guest hostel. <laughs> That's why I have a burden for girls. Can I tell you something I tell my daughters? You are somebody without a man. Can I say it again? You are someone without a man go back to the creative order the first person Eve met was God not Adam God deliberately made sure that happened so that Adam won't be God but today the boys have become God so you see the guy with sagging trousers walking as if he's just been beaten and he's, he's, he's and girls like the guy the guy that's going nowhere no plan for his life. You want to compound it by, by crowding the guy up. <laughs> he loves me. He's a lie. Do you know what love is? Sometimes some of you see love, you run. You see Israel. God said, come, they run. <laughs> and God is love. When you see love, you will run. All right, let's move on here. Hallelujah. Peter gave us a breakdown. Remember he said, after two days, he will raise us up. On the third day, we will live in his sight. Right? Peter now said, Beloved, don't forget this one thing, in whatever you do. That, with the Lord, one day, right, is like what? A thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. Now, two days represent 2,000 years. We are now, you see, it depends on where you reckon it from. 
from Adam, we are actually entering into the seventh day. From Jesus, we are entering into the third day. Depending on where you are counting from. Either the first Adam or second Adam. Because both are Adams. Hallelujah. So the second, you see, and you see, second dimension always renders you vulnerable. Because God has moved. The ark has moved. The pillar has moved. That's why when Herod came, he slaughtered children two years under. Right? Jesus was on another day because he has moved. He could only get those who are what? Two years and under. Are you guys with me? Will you promise yourself you go back to the Bible? Because God doesn't just reveal things to pastors or prophets or whatever. I'm a child of God just like you are. Praise God. God said, Isaiah 43, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. I'm, 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 I quoted this from the NIV. Now it springs up. Do you, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals, honor me, the jackals, blah, blah, blah. The whole essence is that the people I formed for myself. We started from Psalm 102. People yet to be created. But right now, we are moving to what? Formation. Because Adam was both created and formed. The creation was invincible. Genesis 1, Genesis is the creation. Genesis 2, 7, 8. That's the formation. And the Lord God formed man. Jacob was created. Israel was formed. So that born again you, God wants to form. Are you guys here? Hallelujah. Hosea said that God will heal us after two days. On the third day he will raise us up. So the Jews answered Jesus and said, What sign do you want to show us since you do this thing? Jesus said, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And they said, ah, ah, ah. They were like, Brother Nikki. You know Brother Nikki? The book of John, John 3. Nicodemus. <laughs> <laughs> he said, You need to be born again. He said, ah, 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 Jesus, how can I enter my mother? And Jesus Christ went to his disciples. Nikki doesn't understand spiritual things. He said, Are you a teacher of the Jews and you don't understand this elementary, you know? Spiritual principle. The same thing. So you want to raise this temple in three days. 46 years. That's how long it took to build it. But after a while, <laughs> he was speaking, right? Of the temple of his body. Now, that body today is a church, guys. God wants to build Zion again so that the world will fear. Do you want to be part of that company? I don't want to be part of a docile church. Church that just prides itself in numbers. When Jesus was living, his church was 500. In 50 days, he dwindled to 120. Because it took 50 days between when Jesus Christ left and when the Holy Spirit came. That's why 50 is the number of Pentecost. Right? By the time the Holy Spirit came, they were 120. 120, it did not stop the Holy Spirit from coming. God is not about numbers. God is no longer numbering his church. He's weighing it. The intensity. What kind of effect, what strike potential do we have? I don't want crowd. I want a company of warriors. So you see this third day principle actually runs through scripture like a thread. In creation, we see that on the third day of creation, one process was launched. Like begetting like. Right? So if we are living in the third day, monkey can't give back to dogs. Right? We can't have God's children who are wimps. I told them in my church, God does not use the weak. We have been lied to. He calls the weak, but he does not use the weak. He calls the weak, 
strengthens them. Right? And then he uses them. Because I said, God is going to use me anyhow. No, 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 no. Listen to what Billy Graham said that we've been quoting in part. God loves you the way you are. It was a comma. Now we put a full stop. God loves you the way you are, comma. But he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. That's the, you know, the complete quote from Billy Graham. But trust Pentecostals. I like those guys. Smart. Only brain. No spirit. My other grandfather is a Methodist Anglican. Only spirit. I mean, no. They. <laughs> you know. Those other ones. Just the organization. No organism. You see. My ministry is like that of Jeremiah. I don't just pull down. I also build. Because I need to let you know the message he gave to Jeremiah is the one he gave me. He said, my people, they have left me the fountain of living waters. And they have hewn for themselves broken cisterns that can't hold water. That's why you are leaking. Third day of creation, the process was launched. Like was begetting like. Today, God wants his people to look like him. You see, many of, many of us, we look like our pastor. You know what I pray for everybody when I say that? May your child not look like your friend. I am married, I know what that means. <laughs> Imagine my daughter, I see her. The guy looks so much like my best friend. I say, ah, there is a problem here. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations for this child, though. But uh, there's something to discuss here. <laughs> Real. <clears throat> you see, pastors are God's friend. God loves them, but does not want his children to look like them. Because even the pastor is God's child. Now, I'm not saying you can't quote your pastor. You can. I have a lot of things in common with my because Somebody can't influence you and you don't pick some of his traits. Right? That's not what I'm saying. But it gets to a very unhealthy dimension where we no longer quote the Bible, we quote them. Right? Nothing wrong if your pastor wears Jericho, you to wear Jericho. Did I say anything? guys are sharp. <laughs> you know, those, those kind of places, God has worked out. You know, they're just still perceiving the, arrow, the fragrance of his perfume. It's gone for long. They're just having a party. Abraham was on a journey. He saw the mountain of sacrifice also when on the third day. He continues. The Lord came down in the sight of all the people, Exodus 19. He said, this is the third day. Wash your clothes. Get the guys ready. I, am, I no longer want to talk to you through Moses, right? I want to come down and talk to you the way I talk to Moses, face to face. You see, when we come to church, it should be a time when we got, we just compare notes. These things, if I, am, if I have not seen it, I won't be preaching it. I've seen the promised land. I was the accountant of one of the richest churches Nigeria has ever seen. Right? I worked in a church where we were logging in excess of maybe, this was in 1994, 1995, 1993, 1994, 1995. We were logging excess of 60 million in a month. That was Freedom Hall of Redeemed Christian Church of God. I was the accountant. I've seen how God can bless. That's why money is not an issue for me. We had a church, we were planting churches all over the world. We were paying their salary with Naira from here. I've seen what can happen when a people submit absolutely to God. Are you with me? And in that church, we had the style. 
we have the spirit, we have the sincerity, we might look fine and everything, but we're tough. <laughs> oh, we're tough. You can see all the ties, all the designer suit and everything, but we're tough. Carnality we confront. Oh my goodness. We see, we can have it all together. You can be rich and righteous. Money doesn't have to steal your heart. Remember the first time my, you know, my church members gave me a car in Mercedes Benz. God said, put it on the road, not in your heart. Put it on the road, not in your heart. Because many of our cars stay in our hearts. We're driving and we are looking at people are looking. Can they see what I'm, can they see what I'm driving? Can they see? Yeah, because the car gives you status. No, you give the car meaning. Let the car drive itself. You see, consistently, the point I wanted to make, consistently in my church for those times, every time I have an issue to sort out or I want to go see my pastor for counseling and whatever, and I read scripture, by the time I get to church, right from the pulpit, he says it. I don't have to go queue up for counseling. Because we're meeting this, that was our language. We meet in the spirit. Our jokes were spiritual. We're not spooky. But today, Christians are so carnal. You can't preach freely because you quote something they don't even heard about it. When the priest somewhere, turn the book of Nahum. He said, Nahum. <laughs> Nahum. 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 Absolute ignoramus. <laughs> Leviticus 7, on the third day, when this sacrifice said, on the third day there must not be anything flesh again. The remainder of flesh must be consumed. Hallelujah. I like it when people say Holy Ghost fire, Holy Ghost fire. Although there's nothing called Holy Ghost fire in the Bible. Holy Ghost fire, Holy Ghost fire. But see, if there's anything called Holy Ghost fire, that fire is not on the enemy. It's on you. Right? When Elijah called down fire, it was to consume sacrifice. You are the living sacrifice. So when you are saying Holy Ghost fire, it's never on the enemy. Holy Ghost fire, Holy Ghost fire. He is the one who baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You are saying, God, Holy Ghost fire on my enemy. Let them fall down and die. Ignorance. So today we are going to kill the devil. You don't kill spirits. If you want to know Holy Ghost fire, ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? Yes, Nebuchadnezzar shot himself in the leg. When those guys came and said, okay, you know this matter, we're not going to discuss it. We have gotten to a point. If God no longer answers prayer, we will still serve him. Because we are not serving because he answers prayers. We serve him because he's God. So even if he does not answer or if he doesn't deliver us, we are not going to bow. So forget it. The guy was angry. He said, let them hit that furnace seven times. Seven is God's number for perfection. That's why God showed up. That's Holy Ghost fire. When they threw them into that furnace, you know, they were bound. When they got into that furnace, because they themselves are fire, fire can burn fire. It was only the thing the world put on them that God burnt. And the fourth man showed up. And they were having a party. I preached a message on that years ago, dancing in the fire. You know, some of the messages you preach in your life is... Actually, a reflection of the experiences that you are going through. But by that time, I was in fire. There was Holy Ghost fire raging in my life. It's as if all of my friends in life, they've gone. They call meeting in the family. They want to have something, no money to contribute. Say, can we carry chair? <laughs> we don't have it. What can be done physically? We can't, we can't give in cash. We can give kind. <laughs> The reproach, you see, today is a laughing matter, but it wasn't funny then. The reproach, because it's like, eh, you, but you said God called you now. Eh? Come on. But thank God that I had a pastor 
who told me his own story. He didn't come as a superman. Because that's what some pastors do today. It's as if they don't eat. Angels feed them. It's as if one day they say, <clears throat> God just shows up. <laughs> they never talk about it. But my pastor taught me his own issues. And when I was going through it, I said, someone has gone through this before. So I'm definitely going to come out of this. And I'm coming out. Sir. Hallelujah. Amen. On the third day, there was a change in order. Saul died. And David came on the scene. Ezra finished the building of the temple. When? On the third day. Esther came before the king in her royal apparel. When? On the so these are third dimensions. In that third dimension, that was when Esther came and the king stretched out his scepter, which is a symbol of authority and governance. Joshua, this is a governing church. A governing church is a church that wields social, political, and economic influence over the region where it's established. I, I so much love the idea that you are not a Sunday, Sunday Christian. Because all days belong to God. John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That's not Sunday. Yeah. Right? It's the day God chooses to gather you. That's the Lord's day. I love the idea that you are breaking out of the mold. I gave this prophecy and it's coming back again to a pastor, one of the guys I mentored last Sunday. And I'm having the freedom to say that same thing to you. The intention is, Joshua, you are going to be new wine and you won't be desired. Because people say the old is better. Joshua, if you begin to change, some of your friends will turn against you. When you really want to follow God to where God is taking you, a lot of your friends, will, you know, they, they will become like Miriam. They want to get familiar. But Jesus had John who was intimate. He also had Judas who was familiar. Because those two guys are the closest to Jesus. Judas was his treasurer. He spoke in codes to John. He spoke in codes to Judas. He said, Judas, John, you want to know who is going to betray me? Watch. The guy is a gluten. The one I give the biggest portion of food is the one that's going to betray They were speaking in codes. He also spoke and said, um, Judas, that which you want to do, do quickly. They were, they were pretty close. So you see, when you want to follow God, you really want to be current on God's agenda, it will stir up trouble for you. If you want to do what I'm saying, it's going to stir trouble for you. It's going to be like what Jesus Christ experienced when the push comes to shove. He said, you know what? We've come to a point, guys. If you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have any part in me. They said, what sort of religion is this? This is cannibalism. And the Bible says many of his disciples left and they walked with him no more. But Jesus knowing he can do with or without you. He's God beside. He doesn't need your son to be God. He turned to the twelve and said, do you also want to go away? You see, that's the way ministry of Jesus was configured. Right? Difficult to say, to stay, easy to go. He said, do you also want to go away? Or well, he said, God is going to send people like Peter to you. Like I shared with his sister yesterday, the couple, they just relocated to Lagos from my church and we have some issues. I said, you know what? I'm stuck with you. God is going to send people to you. He said, Pastor Joshua, <laughs> to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Right? That's what, you see, you, you must be brought to that point of decision before you can begin to see the church of God's intent. Hallelujah. You guys still with me? Third day, ultimate. Jesus resurrected from the dead. When? 
on the third day. Today, God is calling forth a resurrection too. He wants his church to resurrect from the dead. He wants God. That's why you see, Joshua, the message of the apostles was the message of resurrection. Paul says, the reason I'm being persecuted is because I testified to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that wasn't just a message. They could see it in him. Right? People changed their tone. They saw Paul just survived a terrible shipwreck. Right? And those guys that were in the ship with him, they were looking, what kind of a human being is this? The guy was at peace. Right? He survived and then the guy wanted to warm himself. He gathered sticks and he gathered serpent with it, right? And he put it in the fire. And the snake just got stuck to his hands. And he said, this man is truly a sinner. The devil is looking for him everywhere. He wanted to kill him in the ship. Now he survived that one. Snake is destroying the guy. And they were waiting for Paul to die. The guy just shook it up. And, ah. What was that? And the guy didn't die. He said, ah, this guy is God. <laughs> this guy is God. Because greater is he that is in you than he does in the world. Guys, I believe the Bible. What the Bible says I am, what it says I can do, I believe it. It might not be happening now, but I'm hoping. I have the faith it's going to happen. I'm seeing bits and pieces of it. That truth works. So this is not a talk day. It's critical to embrace the mentality of the day. Is it possible to have break by 12? Just about five minutes and then we just... Oh, great, great. You guys know how to listen to the word. Just chill, eh? Just learn. This is where men are made. This is what separates boys from men. Right? Don't pray for me to finish quick. Pray for capacity. Right? The mentality of this day is simple. It's the centrality of God and his will. You come in to know not just a song that life is not about you. It's about God. Hallelujah. <laughs> The third day intention is the unleashing of the Christs in the earth. The saviors in Zion. The church is not going to just be heard today. It's going to be seen. The Roman soldier will indeed be able to say of a truth. This guy is the son of God. These Christians, they are it. This is what I tell guys in my church. And I'll tell you here. Because of your being attentive. There is nothing the world has that you will ever miss. Are you with me? Is it money? Is it things? Material? God will bring them to you in such a momentous way. Because God needs them. And you are his vessel on the earth. Right? I don't have to chase money. I don't have to chase fame. They chase me. That's what I read in the Bible. These promises will do what? They will follow you and overtake you. As a son of mine that reminded me years ago, he said, Pastor Dodd, I remember when you said you will never queue up in any embassy. He said, that has come to pass. I said, yes, because the earth is the Lord's. There's no gate in any country that can stop me from entering. No visa official that can stop me. <laughs> That's the truth. I'm going places. That was my first time of going to the British Embassy. They stamped my passport. I said, I will never come back here. I won't come back. And I was in my office one day. A guy called from London and said, you know, my pastor just had your message and he wants you to come. I said, tell your pastor to go and get a visa. I'm not going there. Tell him to do everything he can to get a visa. If it, I've never, you go there, you go and queue. You'll be sitting down. One. They're not chasing me from here. When am I? 
I was, I don't, don't talk to me. Get man will be rude, rude to you. And all this kind of thing. For what? God lives in Joss. That's why he lives. He just visit UK once in a while. He lives in Joss. <laughs> he can't live anywhere else. That's where it's happening. That's why the devil hates the city. God lives there. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the guy you know, arranged everything and visa delivered. Aha. Now I'm on my way. And when I got there, it took, it cost your pastor so much for me to get here, so I'm not going to preach in a hurry. So you guys, don't do London with me. <laughs> Sit down. Be ready to shout because people are too quiet here. <laughs> you know, because if they worship in London, it's very quiet. <laughs> very, very religious set of human beings. When Nigerians do get there, they begin to say, you are not a Briton. You grew up in Ajegule. Why are you doing all this? <laughs> so the third day is a day of resurrection. Now listen, not of Jesus, but of you. Right? Because we are going to taste of his death and we're also what? Going to taste of his resurrection. So the new man, that's where I'm going this morning. So it is in this third day that the rapture fever is going to be healed. You know rapture fever? When are you coming, God? You, 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 you read the Bible. The, the, the patterns that God gave will give you an, you know, an inkling as to what is happening. You say Jesus is, I mean, is the groom, right? We are the bride. Huh? You don't have to encourage the, bride, the groom to come. In fact, the groom wants his bride as of yesterday. So it's not that, you know, but if the bride, like they do it in the olden days, if the bride is still a baby, the groom we have to wait. Jesus will marry a minor. Right? This bride must grow up, right? Well dressed, ready to be a bride. But we want Jesus to come. The coming of Jesus is not just an event. The bride must be made ready. When will Jesus come? When we have a church without blemish, without wrinkle, or any such thing. We don't know the date. It's not 25th of March, 2050. Mm -mm. But we know the season. If earthquakes will make Jesus come, he will have come. There's enough. If natural calamity will make him come, he will have come. There has been enough, right? Look at tsunami, 2003, 2004. Look at the earthquake in Haiti. That's enough. Because Bible read the people, you know, when these American prophets, when they see all those say, ah, Jesus is coming now. Look at the earthquake has been happening before my father was born in 1915. So it's not earthquake. It is not the happiness in the world that will make Jesus come. It's the happiness in the church. And we are the generation, right? That's going to land the plane. When the plane is in the landing mode, there's no more posing. If you fly from here to Lagos, when they say they want to land, there's no more distinction between business class and economy. They remove the curtain. Right? They say put, pull up the curtain. Everything, everybody will now be seeing each other. <laughs> That's why I like economy. <laughs> if there's crash, I have hope. First class lunch first with the, with the noose. <laughs> That's just a joke. <laughs> but the point is, when the plane is in the landing mode, there's no more distinction. That's what you see when David brought the ark to Jerusalem. Right? You can't know who is king and subject. The guy danced, his robe fell off. Right? That's why you see when Jesus was going to be betrayed, Judas, the insider, had to kiss him. Because amongst Jesus and his disciples, there's no difference. But within them, they know who God is. When you see a true army, a true army, you don't see private and general. You only see that when they're in the office. In the war front, they all wear battle uniform. Right? Nobody is flaunting rank. You know, I'm the man of God. Yeah. Man of God. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. That's the only thing they understand. Hallelujah. Nothing in their head. I abuse people a lot, right? <laughs> yeah. It's because of my father. My father had high standards. I'm talking about my biological father. He was a teacher. If you come home with your result and you come first, he will look away from the first and check your percentage. <laughs> you have dollars in your class. You come first and you, are, you saw 65% and you came first. That's why you can come first. There are fools in your class. That's what he will tell you. <laughs> He's not impressed with your first. And you know, he taught me not to compete with people but with myself. I'm not happy with my percentage. 65? When there is max obtainable. Max obtained. How many of you remember that? Max obtainable, max obtained. This is obtainable, what is available. And then you take small and you are happy. <laughs> How can you take just 65 out of 100? Move close a bit. 98. Uh -huh. Give two to a teacher. <laughs> it doesn't now matter who came second. Because for athletes, they don't compete with each other, they compete with themselves. They always talk about their personal best. Their personal best. Hussein Bolt competes with himself. He, was, he always wants to beat himself. His last record. He said, that's what church needs to learn. We need to be people who are tenacious. Your prophetic destiny is not a big business. That's not your prophet. Your prophetic destiny is to be able to walk like Christ. Now that can produce a big business. But you can have a big business without that. Let me go back there. See, God is more interested in the Christ who will rise up in you and I than the one that is coming for us. Because that's what he actually brings him. He said, as we are in this world, so is he, right? He's going to come for his likes. God is out looking for God. When he said, Adam, where are you? He was looking for himself. Because can two walk together? Except they've been in symphony. The word agree is actually the word symphonio from two words. Sum and phonio, which means sound. That's why you have that, you know, that keyboard. You can actually have a symphony, right? They are made of different keys, but when you are skillful and you are able to combine them, they give you good music, right? So that's the summation of different sounds. So when divine, a different sound, and human, a different sound, comes together, that's actually what you have. That's actually what is called a human being. No? Human being is human man. Man is spirit. Humus is dust. Right? You guys, hang on with me. I have so much. So you realize that if you read the Bible, if you summarize the Bible, the Bible never focuses on the going of the church. Right? The focus of the Bible is what? The coming of the Lord. That's why I say in this story, the rapture of will be healed. We want to go because we are lazy. We are afraid of Boko Haram. If God wants you in heaven quick, quick, he will have killed you the day you got saved. So heaven is not the issue. Heaven has been given. You have a confirmed ticket. And if you go too quickly, you miss it. If you take your life, you won't go. <laughs> Please tell me when the refreshment is here so that we can have a short break. But I'm looking for a good place to have a break. So on the third day, God is going to, he's restoring his church to his original state and his original intention. Hallelujah. That's the beauty of this move. And some things will not provide it. Yes, sir. Hmm. Is a miracle, sir. Israel saw miracles. Sir. They saw miracles. Look at the plagues in Egypt. Read Psalm 78. They saw miracles, Israel. Look at the parting of the Red Sea. Look at the way Jordan parted. Look at, they saw miracles. But yet, 
they disobeyed God on every point. Miracles don't change people. Crusades can't produce this kind of people. It's going to take we sitting down together with this word and eating it. Gulping it. Right? That which he began to do and to teach. Focus is on truth application. The word must become flesh. Some momentary spiritual experiences will not. There's nothing wrong with miracles. But miracle is a message. It must never be our intention, our pursuit. Your needs are met. I'm telling you. Oh, I've experienced it. Your needs are met. God loves you and that seals it. There's nothing you can do that you will ever be able to jump out of his hands. When you get to a point that some of us had gotten to, God is on your case. God is on my case. If I a Yoruba person here, I want it alone, alone to me. God don't catch me. Right? There are some things I can't just do. There are some things I can't stop. I can't stop his blessings. I don't have to pray for it. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I don't have to pray for it. The richest man on earth didn't pray for money. Solomon didn't pray for money. It was God who introduced the idea of money to him. He said, God, you give me an assignment. You have put me in trouble. You put me in the shoes of my father, David. I don't even know how to fight wars. David had it all together, but you have called me now to be king in David's place. I need wisdom. Give me a wise and understanding heart. And God was stripped. He said, because you've not asked, like some people say, fall down and die. You've not asked for the life of your enemy. He said, wisdom you have. On top of that, I'm going to give you riches that no man before or after you will ever be able to. He said, that's the Bible key. If you want Bible results, follow Bible principles. Adam never asked God for a wife. It was God who introduced the idea of wife to Adam. It's not good for this man to be all one. And before even then, God had provided a wife because they were created male and female. It was in God's idea. Israel asked for a king. It's not, it's in God's original eternal plan that Israel one day will have a king. Right? Right? He has already proclaimed that Judah, the scepter will not depart from Judah. God had the plan of a king. But a God to a point said, give us a king so that we can be like the other nations. And God said, eh. You are not asking for a king or you are rejecting me because I'm your king. And God gave them Saul. He even warned them. This guy is going to deal with you. And Saul is the most foolish person I've ever seen in my life. The guy sat down during his coronation and somewhere I read a speech. We are coronating this man today because you rejected God. And the guy still put his head. <laughs> Did you see that? If I was Saul, I would run. Can you imagine? You rejected God and they are picking you and you stayed. There's no way you can be right. Saul was not needed. But David, Adam, they were busy going about God's business. Right? And royalty walked right up to them. Wife walked right. It was God who said, hey, 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 hey. See, sister. And God brought Eve and Adam said, my goodness. This kind of thing exists. Everything else is God, you are wonderful. This, you know me truly. You know what I need. <laughs> That's it. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. That's no sorrow. You see, what you struggle to get can easily become your God. Some people are afraid when they don't have money. 
that money will never come. When the money comes, they are afraid the money will go. So they are perpetually in fear. But God wants to restore. Hallelujah. The third day agenda summary is this. The margins of a new man company. A new man company. The likes of whom had never been seen. A company of men and women, boys and girls that has always in our dreams. The church of God's dreams. That's the assignment that he has given to me. To let you know, to learn from the woman in John 4, that if you continue to drink from this water, you will be thirsty again. But as a water that I will give, says Jesus, that when I give this water, what you've been coming to get, coming to get, coming to get, you carry around. Yeah. It's going to become what? A well inside of you springing forth to eternal life. Church has been program based. Nothing wrong with program, but we're not based on programs. Church must be process based. The programs must have an intention, not a pilgrimage. And my brother was sharing with me, you know, yesterday we got to, ja is it, is it, is it, the name of that place that we had the traffic, Jaji, where they were praying, the mosque. Okay, slightly after Kao, they were praying and the place was jammed, traffic and everything. I said, Pastor, you can't believe that people come from Jaji to come and pray here. He thought he made a very great point. I said, religion is the same. People travel from Zaria to camp to go and pray. Religion is the same. Every month, though, they go to kilometer 42, kilometer 46, because it's about redemption camp to go and pray. It's the same. Religion is the same. Whether Islam or Christianity, that's why I'm not a Christian. I resigned from Christianity the day I discovered that God is not a Christian. Yeah. He's not a Christian. It was the world that called us Christians. God is not a Christian. Oh, you think God is a Christian? He's not, oh. Maybe you don't know. Maybe I should announce it. God is not a Christian. He's neither a Muslim. He's God. That's why when I filled form, I filled that form for my daughter. They didn't take her in that school. Religion has a norm. They didn't take her. So I got wise. Say, give unto Caesar. What is Caesar? <laughs> and to God, what is God? Because Caesar himself belongs to God. Religion, none. You don't know the pit that the church has fallen into. I'll tell you the story what happened to me at the American Embassy. I went to apply for a visa to go to the U.S. in 2009. And the lady asked me, what do you do, sir? I said, I'm a pastor. Oh, really? Pentecostal or which one? I said, if I begin to tell this woman now, apostle or whatever, apostolic and prophetic, this woman, wanted, okay, I'm Pentecostal, okay. She said, oh, really? We're just typing, we're just doing some other things. She said, excuse me, what's the Great Commission? I was shocked. Great Commission? He said, yes, what's the Great Commission? I said, we're going to the world and preach the gospel. Baptizing all of them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He He allowed me to cool down again. Where is that in the Bible? Huh? I want to travel, not to go and preach. <laughs> is this a theological or whatever? He said, Why is that in the Bible? I said, Matthew 28. It dawned on me. People come here to lie that they are pastors. That's why she was asking me those questions. Because if you are not a pastor, if you are not in church, you won't know, you won't know those things. The way it came. With the suddenness. Because those guys are trained. I said, this is how, how terrible church has been. People come here to lie that they are pastors. Imagine if that guy is not a pastor. And they ask, what's the Great Commission? The guy is... Um, uh, actually, you know, like that Britain, they ask, there are two books in the Bible named after women. One is Ruth, what's the other one? You say Gloria. 
She didn't even think. He said, Gloria. Because Gloria sounds like glory and, uh, you know. She didn't know. If you don't know, better quickly go and check so that, so that you won't be laughing at yourself. You know, this is... <laughs> this is the company that we want to be part of. Right? And that's what I want to talk about briefly after our break. Because... I need to be out of here by one. So the journey is far. That's what the angel told Elijah. He said, eat, but the journey is far. But what happened to Elijah too will happen to you. The Bible says he went in the strength of that meal for 40 days. 40 in the Bible is the number of a generation. What a generation can get done in 40 years, they will be replaced. He went in the strength of that meal for 40 days. What I'm giving you, my prayer for you, is that this word will wash you. It will alter something in your life. Amen. It will usher you into a new day and you begin to function in that day. Amen. You will not dwell on old manner. Amen. Today, the church doesn't know itself. This is one guy I love to read about, Carl Bath. Carl Bath. For you to appreciate the thing that he wrote. It's a 16th century theology. So you know that this truth is as old as time itself. He said, our capacity for self-deception is great. And we deceive ourselves. That process is lifelong. He said, therefore, again and again, human beings must let themselves be shown who they really are. Read that again and meditate on it. Reflect on it. That's why I said yesterday here that Jesus Christ didn't come to earth to introduce God to us. He came to introduce us to us. You see, if you don't know you, you will never have a need for God. And every time you really, really see God, you know who you really see? You. Right? It's you. You will never really know yourself until you see yourself through the eyes of God. Check the Bible. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah 6, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his influence, his robe fills the whole temple. Right? Yeah. And I said, oh, God is beautiful. No! And I said, woe is me. Every time you see God, really, is you that you see. That's why the Bible is a mirror. Many of us, we are reading the Bible, we've not allowed the Bible to read us. Right? As in water, face answers to face. Right? James said that those who hear and don't do that like the man beholding himself in the mirror and he walks away and immediately he forgets what kind of person. What you really discover in your search for God is you. When you see God, who do you see? You see yourself. Hallelujah. I'll continue until you guys tell me to stop. Now, Genesis 1 to the 6 says that man was made in the image, Right? And the likeness. Is it possible to go to school for a few minutes? Huh? You guys can handle it? You see, First Chronicles 15, I think verse 2 and 3 there says that. It says, for a long time, Israel was without the true God. Why? Because there's no teaching priest. I just finished a, a, a session, a series on holiness in my church. And what triggered it was that God said there is a generation in church, they've never heard the message of holiness. All they've heard is just cliches, jibes, catchy phrases. You know, God will give you double for your trouble. Those are the things that built them. And that's why they are lifeless. 
we have a generation in church that has not been taught. Let's look at you can look at man being made in the image of God, number one, in a prophetic light. And then number two, in an experiential light. What do I mean by prophetic light? That is what and who man should be and able to do. Potential. Then experience what we actually see man to be and what man is doing and seem to be capable of doing. Now, this is where we are confused. Man created in the image and likeness of God. And you see the man floundering, quaking under the influence, situations, and circumstances of the world. Let's look at scripture to back that up. 1 John 3, 1 to 3. What we are, that's what we shall be. That's what we, you know, you actually read there. He said, behold, no, let's read it please. I thought I actually put that up. Or is it there? No. First John 3, 1 to 3, who has a very loud voice? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Yeah. That we should be called the sons of God. Mm. Therefore the world knoweth us not, mm. because it knew him not. Mm. As he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. himself. Even as he is pure. Thank you. Now that's the tension. Right? What we are and what we shall be. The moment there is a schism there, if you are not living who you are with the sight, with your sight on what he's destined you to be, you can't be an effective Christian. You will live a life of excuses. We are just human beings. God, don't, God, doesn't, God only understands himself. And now that's what Paul wrote about in First Corinthians, I mean Second Corinthians 4, 3 to 7. He said, but we have this treasure. Right? It is buried in an earthen vessel. And that's the way God created Adam. Right? He created the man's spirit, Genesis 1, 26. He formed the man of the dust of the ground and he put the treasure himself inside that earthen vessel. Now, his intention is the treasure on the inside begins to direct, right, the earthen vessel that's on the outside. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are truly the offsprings of God. But what's leading us today? Hallelujah. Then Peter gave a further clarification. He said, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the Lord, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power, by the way, while you were reading, I thought to counsel you, can you get new King James? King James is not from heaven, he's from England. Hmm? So that you can read the Bible in the language that you speak. Hmm? It's good to have a copy of this. This is the original. But get new King James that, that remove all of the confesseth and the doeth and the, you know, so that, you know, you can, because there are some things there that it will just throw you off balance. Say for evil communication, corrupt governor, what's that? Doesn't sound right. But new King James is the evil conduct. Communication. And condo, they don't, they, they, don't, they don't look alike. It's old English. But I ban every teenager in my church, they must not read King James. We don't want spooky people. He that confess it, you don't speak like that when I doubt comments to my house. <laughs> or you see the baby that you, that you want to marry and say, Behold, he cometh. <laughs> the baby just walk past you. <laughs> Say, this one is not ready. I joke with it. I do. You know, I can have fun with it. In fact, I think I have somewhere in my notes. 
you know. Peter said, his divine power has given to us how many things? All things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue by which he had given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these promises we might be what? We might be partakers of the divine nature. The word life there is the word zoe. Zoe is the life of God. There are two words in the Bible used for life. One is bios, one is zoe. Bios is natural life, where you get the word biology. Right? But zoe is the substance inside of God that makes God God. That's what is called the divine nature. And he said, by these promises, not that we might have a car, not that we might have a husband, not that we might have a wife, or get a good job, but the promises have only one aim, to make us partakers of what makes God God. That's why I say, ye are God's. And he explained it because all of you are the offsprings of the Most High. And we said on the third day, like must be getting like. The word beget is different from born. That's why you see genealogies in the Bible, only men give birth. You never see women there. Have you noticed? Yes, only men give birth. Because that birth is spiritual birth. It's not transference of sperm. It's transference of godly virtue. It is seed being transmitted, not sperm. Hallelujah. That's what is going to make us to escape the corruption that is in the world that is arresting a lot of people by lust. The world will flaunt things at you. Let's look at the points that Karl Barth made about man so that we can begin to understand this new man concept. He said, we can't know real man till we know him and in through Christ. Therefore, we must discover what man is only through what we find Jesus Christ to be in the gospel. Okay, okay, we can go on break, right? Okay, people are tired, right? Just stretch. Ten minutes. Or you want me to continue until the refreshment comes? Choose you this day who you will serve. <laughs> <laughs> I can preach forever. I can preach five hours non-stop, but I'm having mercy on you. You want me to continue or you want to go and break? Huh? Break. Let me see your hand. Let demons be crazy for a while. <laughs> Democracy means demons are crazy. That's what it means. Break. Let me see your hand. Continue. Let me see your hand. They continue. Have it. Bam. <laughs> okay. Pastor has it. Let's go and break. You really want us to go and break, right? 10 minutes and we'll be back. I'll use that too to drink water. Thank you one more time for this privilege you've given me to come and share my life with you. This is where we left off. Are we all awake? Yes, sir. You guys can watch with me for one more hour. Yes, sir. Jesus asked for just one hour. And that's what I'm asking for. We're looking at, you know, the perspectives of this guy called Calbath. And because if we say that the third day is about unveiling the ultimate man, then we must understand the function and the configuration of that man, right? In Bible light, right? The world is trying to define us. So that we can use things to define ourselves. We can use created things to define ourselves, which is an impossibility. You see, I need to stress that point because church has become so need-oriented. As much as I like giving testimonies, you, never, you, you really have very few testimonies of people you know, getting to know God more. It's only the things that God has done, not who is becoming in their lives. And your generation, under 25s, under 30s, under 35s, we must not continue along that line. Am I saying we can't be thankful? No. Right? But things must not define us. Nothing earthly must you use to define yourself. Not the things you have. The Bible says a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he owns. 
We need to come back. Do yourself that favor. Get back into the word of God. And use the word of God to define yourself. And Calbert said that all that may and should be known about man in God's image can only be found in Christ. You see, Christ is the pattern, you know, is actually the pattern man. Say pattern. What's a pattern? A mold after which others are actually fashioned after. Are you with me? Somebody described it beautifully. He said God was actually in printing business. And he caught a plate. And he called him Adam. Right? And now he took that plate to the press and rolled out copies. The first copy that he rolled out, after a while, the ink ran. It got washed off. But because the plate is intact, Whatever happens to the copies, it doesn't trouble the printer. Because he can go back to the press and roll out more. That plate was himself. Christ is the pattern man. He's also the pattern God. Because he's the only one that we've ever seen. He's the only God we've ever seen. That humans have ever seen. Please hang on with me, guys. What you are hearing is life shaping, is life threatening. <laughs> but I believe, and my prayer is that what is going to threaten is that which is not right in your life. Whatever God has not planted in terms of ideas and mentalities, God is going to uproot. May you not know, church, may you know the kingdom of God. Because the church is a means, not an end. And whatever the means becomes the end, we have entered into active idolatry. Don't worship, worship. Worship God. I'm playing with words here. Imago similitudo. I won't bother you with all that. But John 1.18 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, has declared Him. Now, this is John 1.18. The intention of Jesus being the only begotten was that Jesus might become a pattern. Because by the time we get to Revelation, He dropped the title, the only begotten. He became the first begotten. Because there are now many other begottens. It was for these many other begottens that he died. Hebrews 12 says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. He took on a shameful death on the cross. Ask yourself the question, what was the joy that was set before him? The joy was not him going back to heaven. He already had that. The joy was many more like him was going to come. And was willing to pay the price. Now, his death will be in vain if the only thing you do is to just get saved and you never come to that point of attaining that stature of the fullness of Christ. Hallelujah. That was the, 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 the dialogue that happened between Moses and God while they were in the wilderness. Moses had to sensitize God. The only place the Bible says God repented. Because the guys were so stiff-necked, they were stubborn, and God said, Moses, step out of the way. Let me destroy these guys. And I will, he, he, he promised Moses, I'm going to raise another generation from you. Maybe today we won't have Israelites, but Mosaites. God meant it. God doesn't play with words. He wanted to really finish them off, but Moses said something. He said, the word we say you are able to bring them out of Egypt, but you can't take them to the promised land. Parallel. Context. That God can only save you. He can't make you like Christ. I don't want the world to abuse God on my case. Everything that the kingdom has to offer, I want to get. 
And the primary thing that kingdom has offered is that we be the exact image and likeness of God. He says his commandments are not grievous. These things are impossible with men. But with God, that promise, are you with me? That promise with God, all things have been possible, was not directed at material things in the Bible. It was the rich young ruler, right, that I spoke about yesterday, that actually said that that's not possible. I can't leave my stuff, carry a cross and follow you. And the disciples came because the disciples too were not poor. Right? Because he said it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were concerned because they were not poor. He said, who then can be saved? He now said what? With man, this is impossible. But with God, by the workings of the Spirit, piece of cake. Even when the other version, the, 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 the other instance where that particular phrase was used, Luke 1 37, right? It was in a virgin given birth to God. So it's all about attaining the stature of Christ. Paul said, The God who saved me to reveal his Christ in me. Paul spoke there about the two dimensions of salvation. Christ revealed to you and Christ revealed in you. The one who was revealed to you must be revealed in you. You must, be, you must become an outward expression of him. In thought, word, and intent. Now there lies the mystery. The implication is both the image and the similarity that man has with God it was found in Jesus Christ. So Jesus was born both man and God it was both man and God at the same time. Now there lies the mystery. There lies the tension. Because man is both man and God in one. There's part of us that is earthly. There's part of us that is divine. And like I just gave the, that analogy of, you know, the making of the tabernacle. He started out as wood. He ended up as gold. That's why I love a song by David Crowder Band. He said, I am full of both debt and you. Right? I'm full of both what? Debt and you. Because God is holy. Hallelujah. <sighs> Follow me, guys. I sense God doing something here. This is the way the Bible describes Jesus Christ. It says he's the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's personality. The word express image there is from a word impress. Again, it's a, you know, it's a printer's... You know a seal? You know a seal? A document. I mean, that, that thing that they use to seal documents. Now, if you impress it on a paper, right... Number one thing he does is alters the shape of that paper. The paper takes on the shape of the seal. And then, number three, when you touch the paper, you actually feel the impress. Are you guys with me? Those are the three levels. There must be contact between you and God. Right? He makes an impression on you, altering your shape. And then when the world comes to interact with you, what they touch is the seal that has made an impression on you. Is that clear? Guys, this is Salvation 101. <laughs> because the word express image is actually the word character. Because what you feel there is what? The character of the seal. See, character is not in right or wrong actions. It's a nature. Right? It's a nature. You feel, maybe many of you didn't grow up to actually meet electric typewriter. The one that hits the paper. When you talk, some actually, if, yeah, the one that actually threw the carriage like that. Some, if you come with a wrong paper, it actually tears the paper. 
Because that thing has, you know, you know, it's like a seal. It hits the paper and makes impression on it. Now, when that is done, when you read that paper, it's no longer blank. Right? It's no longer blank. You're actually reading a story of what the typewriter has impressed on it. Hallelujah. Oof. I'll skip this one. Okay, now. Image is the material expression. Person is its very essence. Now, the Bible says that Adam was created in the image and the likeness of Jesus. Jesus is the plate. Who created Adam? Jesus. Let me show you in scripture. That's why he was the first and Jesus is the last. Amen? Enjoy your drink but focus. You know the way the army of Gideon drank? Mm. All right. It's as if I have a scripture for everything. But don't, don't blame me. If you hang around the Bible too much, it, it overwhelms you. They drank with their eyes on the assignment. Right? Those who laughed like a dog, they missed it. They were not conscripted into the army. So drink that stuff. Eat the biscuit with sandals on your feet. <laughs> Hallelujah. So there are two Adams. Look at this. Then God said, Genesis 1, let us, plural, make man in our image, plural, according to our likeness, plural, let them have dominion, blah, 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 blah. Look at from where I highlighted in yellow. So God created them in his singular. God doesn't waste words. Right? When the actual creation was going to happen, there was a plate, there was a blueprint. It was his image, not our image again. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Something changed in this whole process. Because if you continue along the same line of let us in our image and everything has been so God created man in their own image, right? In the image of them, they created him. <laughs> Male and female, they created them. But God there and was singular. Because the, primary, the physical expression of God is Jesus Christ. And how does that work in your own? What's your name? Michael. You are supposed to be Michael Christ. Right? You see, Christ is not Jesus' son name. It's not. His surname was Joseph. If you go to a school where you went to in, you know, is it Bethlehem or not? Yeah. yeah, in Nazareth High School or Nazareth Community School. <laughs> it's, jo it's JJ. That's what his classmates call him. Yes, Jesus Joseph. Mm. So Christ is the power that's at work in him. That's why if you read Paul, you see, Paul is such a writer. Early revelation of Jesus that Paul had, he called him Jesus Christ. After a while, he changed it, Christ Jesus. Right? Because the Christ now, because what's inside, must you, we must begin to learn to live from within. We can't get patterns from what is around. Hallelujah. When you enter the tabernacle of Moses, in the outer court, the sun is the source of light. That's an all-commerce affair. When you get to the inner court, right, there's candle, that's the Holy Spirit. There's no ray of natural light into that place. Now, sun has its benefits. My forefathers, when they go to the farm, they use the sun to no time. Yeah, they look at the sun, if his head is 12 noon, and they're never wrong. Cock crows every 15 minutes. Accurate. God is... Mm. The fool indeed has said there is no God. I got to the Philippines. I realized that cock crows in Nigeria the same way they croak in Philippines. I said, maybe the, the chickens were not there at the Tower of Babel. They didn't, their language was not confused. 
I just saw a Filipino chicken. Kokoroko. I said, my goodness, do you understand Nigerian Kokoroko? It was Kokoroko in the Philippines. God is dead accurate. <laughs> That's why, guys, don't judge by this pigmentation. God has no color. Right? I have white friends. They won't go to a church if Jesus was put there as a white man in Africa. He said, create your own Jesus who is black. Who says Jesus was white? Who says? Well, let me stir up controversies here. <laughs> let me leave that. What's man's destiny? Man's call in the letter Paul wrote to the Romans. He said your call, regardless of what the physical expression of that call might be, a tailor, a, an actor, a musician, a bricklayer, a lawyer, a doctor, those are secondary calls. Primary call for believers, all of us, we have one call. We are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's our call. Now some might do that singing. Right? Some express that in bricklaying. Some express that in design. Some express that in singing. Some express that in many ways. But everything must be leading to a point where we are on a journey. Your prophetic destiny is to be what? To be conformed to the image of Christ. Hallelujah. Man's destiny. Paul wrote, also wrote to the church in Colossae. He said, but now you yourselves, you have to put off all this. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, fill the language out of your mouth. Don't lie to one another since you have put up the old man with his deeds. And have put on a new man. It is now this new man company. That's what I'm talking to you about. That is God's present order to unleash, to release, to unveil this new man company. And they are renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created them. So that when we get there, there's no male, no female, no Jew, no Gentile, no Greek, no white, no black. Right? That's why in our secondary school, if you look at our form, there's no state of origin. And we did that intentionally. We don't want the Chinedu to see the Femi to see themselves as different. Right? Because there are still some believers who won't marry outside of their tribe. You are going to hell. <laughs> Why? You are not a Christian. It's as simple as that. Right? You're going to hell. Am I too tough? But it's simple. If one who is not a Christian goes where? Huh? And the beautiful thing about hell is that everybody in hell, they are saved. But they are saved too late. Go to hell and ask, do you believe Jesus is Lord? Everybody say, yes! Yes! Yes, now we know. Everybody in hell are born again. But they believe too late. <laughs> oh my God. I love God. And now, that won't just happen. Man becoming God, God ruling the man, it takes a process. And Paul explained that. He said, there is a natural body, right? And there is a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. Right? The last man, Adam, Jesus, became what? A life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first. No one gets saved from their mother's wombs. The spiritual is not first. But the natural. And afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. You see, there are two pastor dots. One was born 10 p.m. Wednesday, 20th February, 1963. Right? Another one was born on the 31st of December, about a minute to 12, 1989. Right? 
And for a long time, the two were in conflict. Because Ishmael and Isaac dwelt in Abraham's house for a while. The wheat and the tears, they grew together for a while. But by the time it got to the time of harvest, there must be a separation. How many nations entered the Red Sea? Two. How many came out? One. I like the way you sing, guy. Honestly. Because singing is not just about uttering words. It must be expressed. It must be demonstrated. You must put actions to it. That's why the young ones didn't like the Orthodox churches. Hymns. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And you just go... Mm. <laughs> It's Vilium 260. <laughs> Let's come back here. First man was of the earth, made of dust. Second man of the, is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. Now, as we have borne the image of the man of dust... We shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Woo. This is sweet. This is how it works. <laughs> Ishmael was older than Isaac. Right? That's why it's called an old man. It's not my father. My old man was crucified with the Lord, with Christ. That's not my father. <laughs> it's my old, because he's older than my new man. Now, for a long while, the old man has been, you know, in ascendancy. Now, the new man needs to come up. Right? Because when the wheat and tears grow, they look alike. Wheat and tears look alike. You can only know their difference with sight, with discernment, but it becomes clear at the time of harvest. Because the wheat will have had fruit and it bows under the weight of the fruit. But the wheat, the tear stands tall in pride. That's how to know the difference. At the time of harvest, the wheat is worshipping. It lays prostrate. The tear stands tall. And pride goes before it fall. It's plucked out. You guys still following me? So Jesus bore both images. You see, God is not the author of confusion. He won't ask us to follow the example of Christ if it's impossible. That's why Christ had to come as a man. He was subjected to everything. He was hungry. And the Bible deliberately put those things in scripture. He sat by the well, hungry, detailed. So that you can identify with him. Because if you can't reckon with his humanity, you can't reckon with his deity. Look at the way Paul put it. Paul, a born servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated with the gospel of God, which he promised before through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and then declared to be the son of God according to the spirit of holiness. The resurrection. So you see Jesus both, both, both images. He didn't go to the cross and he was smiling. He said, I'm God. No, he nearly gave it up. In the garden. He wasn't just written there. The humanity spoke up. God, if it's possible, because your humanity will always want to bargain with God. If it's possible, let this cup pass. But he said, nevertheless, not the way I want it. Now, that is the mentality of this new man company. Right? It is not a denial of the old man. Right? But the acknowledgement of the new man and putting that new man in sub, I mean, in authority over the old man. The, the old man spoke up. If it be possible, you see, if Jesus gave it up then, today we won't be praying in Jesus' name. God will start again. Jesus was just a conduit. 
Abraham that we read about is not the first one God called. We read about him because he's the first one that obeyed. God called his father, Terah. They set out to go to you know, Canaan. He got to Haran and died. And because he died because he made Haran home rather than Canaan. When transition is incomplete, it's tantamount to death. The new man concept. We have to experience that mystery. The mystery of being man and being God. If the third day is like begetting like God wants to have gods. God is his description. He's the one who is in charge. Even unbelievers say, the, the problem of Nigeria, it will take God. It's a description. And you see that in the book of Daniel. He said, what you are asking, O King Nebuchadnezzar, can only be solved by gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. They're talking about you and I. And Daniel pioneered that. He said, because an excellent spirit was found in Daniel. Daniel could, could, could solve enigmas. But you see, this is where we are going, guys. The church has been taught to pray. And we need to, because this generation, we have not even learned how to pray. But there's something higher than prayer. Prayer is a means. When you rise up from the place of prayer, we need a church patterned after the likes of Joseph. Joseph did only interpret dreams, which is like prayer. He could, he could also articulate sound economic policy. Right? What he received in the place of praying in that dream that he was able to, he was, you know, you know, he was able to capture and say, this is what you saw, Pharaoh. He said, those 14 years are seven years of abundance and seven years of famine. Economic policy. In the time of abundance, save. Right? So that in the time of famine, you have something to draw from. Daniel wasn't just able to read the writing on the wall. He was also a sound administrator. We find some Christians that they can really pray, but they fail at work. No skill. No insight. You must be a reference point in your class. You know why I didn't get saved in school? Because those Christians didn't have anything that I didn't have even more. I beat them in class. With my marijuana and my drink and everything, as mad as I was, I beat them in class. I had a two one. If I was a Christian, I'd tell you I'd make a first class. I'll be less distracted. <laughs> I can focus. And then above all, I have the Holy Ghost. Whoops. I'm telling you, I'll make a first class. Because I've come to discover revelation of the word is not by much study, it's by obedience. God doesn't unveil scriptures to you because you study. Anybody can study. But it's by obedience. It's by yielded hearts. When your heart is yielded and God sees it, he breaks the seals because he knows you are going to do it. You want to understand the Bible? Obey it. That's why Jesus had to learn how to obey. Though he was a son, Yet he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. So those who live in the reality of this mystery, they are the ones who make up this new man company. Aware of their earthliness and also aware of their heavenliness. I'm not talking about being heavenly good and earthly useless, but having the best of both worlds. That's the beauty of Christianity that many don't know. You have the best of both worlds. You have the good things of this life. And you also have eternity. God is good though. Yeah. Honestly. The new man company. What minute this? I told you I, I read King James too. <laughs> Let's look at this scripture. I finish by one. Is that okay? So for the joy of one o'clock that is said before you, endure. 
Let's look at this scripture in the book of Genesis. Then the Lord said, Behold, you know this scripture? Man has just fallen. Man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Let's send him out. Let's reflect on this. Questions that should come to your mind. I suggested some here. Does this statement suggest that man was not like God before this time? You want me to read it again? Man has become like one of us. This was after they took of the tree that God said they shouldn't take. To know good and evil. Now, let's he put, a, put his hand to take us of the tree of life, eat and live forever. Let's send him out. Am I right to ask this kind of question? You know, these are the things that came to me in my reflection. Does this suggest that man was not like God before this time? Was it the rebellion that made man like God now? He said, because man has not become like one of us. Is it that God does not want man to know good and evil? Or is knowing good and evil wrong? You know, these are valid questions, isn't it? So think with me. You see, when you read the Bible, you think read. You read reflectively. Is this a good exercise? If I had time, we would have discussed it. When I taught this in church, we actually discussed it. What minute this? <laughs> What's going on here? Think. Man rebelled, and God said, man has not become like one of us. If the man takes the tree of life, he will live forever in a fallen state. He said, man, man now knows good and evil. Is knowing good and evil wrong? If it's wrong, then what happens to Hebrews 12? Or Hebrews 5, 12? Well, when he says that who, you know, those who are mature, those who, are, who have reason of use, they have exercised their senses to be able to discern good from evil, right? Let's go on here. You have to know the implications of those statements for God's ultimate intention for man. The way God acted, his intention for man was at the back of his action. Let me send this man out so that he's not permanently in a fallen state. Because what God told man was to keep feeding on the tree of life. You know what? In the tree of life, you will eventually come to no good and evil. But through the right door. Because if you come through the wrong door, when you do good, you justify yourself. When you do wrong, you condemn yourself. That's why Christians don't live by conscience. Conscience is from two words, co-science. Two sources of knowledge. And you know that both good and evil were in the same tree. So the good of that tree and the evil, they are from the same source. And James says that, can you get fresh and bad water from the same river? Are you guys still with me? Yes, sir. Please don't lose me. Because I'm making up my mind that I won't lose you. <laughs> Let's move on here. You see, God's eternal quest is not just to have sons, but to have sons who can rule and also reign. There are two different things. In Britain, the queen is reigning, but is not ruling. She doesn't have executive powers. The House of Commons rule. Are you with me? The Prime Minister rules. But God is looking for sons who will not just reign, but also rule. Because the original call was for us to have dominion, right? To dominate. It's very critical. In the quest for ruling and reigning, the configuration of man is critical. 
right? Because there is a way to rule and reign in the kingdom. Follow me as I unfold this. Because I want to tell you the basic trait of this new man company. There's no way I can finish it today. But I'll take it to a point where you'll understand it. Is that okay? And I'm leaving the PowerPoint with, with Joshua. Now, this is where the key is. Man is equipped with the ability for self-determination. What does that mean? Let me announce to you, there are a lot of things you can do without God. God created you and I with the ability to live independently of him. That's why unbelievers are still alive. If you get up here today and say, I'm no longer serving God, it's not likely a car knocks you down there. That's why obedience, the value of obedience is measured in terms of the fact that there's a chance for disobedience. The reason you celebrate success is because there's a chance of failure. If success is given, it has no value. Are you guys with me? Okay. It gets clearer as we go on. What is this self-determination issue? God gave this gift to man. But God has an intended use of this gift up his sleeves. And he requires that man discover that secret and act accordingly. In the garden, that's the reason why God put two trees there. Right? And he only counseled the man. He didn't command him. Hmm? Now, this is the mystery. God gave you that gift, that ability of self-determination. But you know what? He didn't really want you to use it. I had a serious beef with a guy in my church this week. He posted something on Facebook. He said, it's wrong to say that if I don't pay tithe, God is going to make my life miserable. That if God really wants the tithe that bad, he will have taken it and given me my 90%. That's what he said. Now, that's what self-determination does. You can talk back at God. If he made you a good, it's not your fault now. If he make you a good and all you're doing is, meh, meh, then he'll be mean. <laughs> you have only one syllable, meh. <laughs> now, the guy said, and I said, you, you don't understand something. God will give you everything. But he expects that you give it back to him. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without trust in Him, whatever you don't do with God willingly is of no use. God can only call you Joshua. He can't force you. Your response now is your own choice. Are you guys still with me? I'm going somewhere here. Now, this is a long read here, but I'll bring the meat out of it. It's talking about here, you know, I don't know if any of you have heard of the original sin. Original sin. Original sin is actually thinking or acting independently of God. Because this is the way God commanded Adam. He said, of every tree in the garden, right, you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you must not touch it. The day you touch it, you die. Okay. Listen, when I read that, I said, God, you are so gracious. That means in that garden, there are more opportunities to do right than do wrong. There was only one wrong tree. Right? But you see, we often go there when we brandish our self-determination gift that God has given us, which we are supposed to have submitted to him. I always do this exercise everywhere I go. To let you know that the fallen nature is still in you. If I stand and said, don't look at my shoes. Your face goes zoop. That's why we don't even raise children right. 
Because all we do is don't, 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 don't. And they want to see what is, what is that? Why are they hiding this thing? <laughs> it's a long read, but I'll bring out the meat. He said, oh, do you know, James 4, 5, and 6, do you think that the scripture says in vain that the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace? Therefore, he says, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is but a vapor that appears today, and tomorrow is gone. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, right, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good, what is the good you ought to say if the Lord wills? That is, every time you take unilateral decisions without consulting with God, that's original sin. Because Adam took of that tree, when the suggestion came from Eve, you will have said, wait, wait. Uh, sir, God, that tree you said we shouldn't eat. Eve said uh, it's not a good idea. What do you think? That would have changed the whole story. That's why Paul said Adam was not deceived, Timothy. Adam did it in self will, he wasn't deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing. Didn't Paul say that? He said Adam was not deceived. For God, in his gracious manner, he used it to do a number on the devil. Where the devil thought he scored the highest point, it was at that same point that God defeated him. He said, you know what? Listen before you shout. This thing that you have done. The moment that thing happened, God came and said, oh, I see what you've done. Merry Christmas. The seed of this woman will bruise your head. Now, the devil got confused. Women don't have seeds. That's when he prophesied the virgin birth. Right? The one that's going to do this is not going to come according to the order of man. It's going to be a spirit birth. Oh my goodness. Now, at that point, Jesus didn't sin. First Corinthians 5.21 he said, for him who knew no sin, he chose to become sin. Just as Adam chose to fall with the wife. Right? You know, Eve took it first. And nothing happened. Because the source was still intact. It was when Adam took it, the Bible said, and then their eyes were opened. If when Eve took it, Adam had run to God. See what has happened though? At that time, Jesus will have come because the provision has been made. When was Jesus crucified? In Revelation. Before the foundation of the world. Not even before the creation of man. That was when they decided we are going to make man. The man is going to, have, is going to be a free moral being. But you see, is this our free moral being that is a problem of the world today? And those who will rise above that free moral being are going to be in this new man company. God is looking for yes men. God is looking for puppets. <laughs> the 21st century you don't, don't want to hear this. You can't make decisions for me. I have a head. That's the language of the 21st century. But he didn't ask himself, who gave you the head? The Genesis 3.22 issue. The issue in that scripture was that man used the ultimate gift wrongly. <laughs> and God's love sent man out of the garden to pave way for redemption. Because if man had taken of the tree of life in that state, there would have been no room for redemption. That's why God had to station an angel there with a flaming sword. Don't come back here until you're fixed. 
So Jesus was now sent to model the ultimate man. So Jesus is the portrait of this new man company. Are you guys with me? So the use of that ultimate gift was what singled Jesus Christ out as the ultimate man. Jesus had his brain intact. He was a sharp guy. At age 12, he was questioning the scribes and all the Pharisees and the doctors of the law, right? The guy wasn't a dullard. But he chose not to. Listen, that's where I'm going here. Look at his prayer. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come because you too have a kingdom. Right? As a human being, you have a kingdom. You have a world that no one can enter except by your permission, including God. God can't enter without your permission. You see, where, where the deeper life of this world in those days missed it is that they forced coerced people to be born again. If I have stories of people beating up their children, they beat Christ into them. <laughs> Ram Jesus into their soul. <laughs> like my father would call me, hey, come here! Yes, sir. Come, my father, you don't joke with him. Promise me you will never drink again. I promise, sir. I promise. Neither! I promise. Okay, go. Right back to the alcohol. You can't force me. It's going to take moral suasion. I need to see what is wrong with that thing before I can change my mind. When I decided to quit, no one told me. Right? And I never went back there. When I met my wife, she didn't like alcohol and cigarettes. And I stopped for six months. It was six months of torture. Every time I see somebody smoking, I say, ah, this man is lucky. <laughs> Nobody's breathing down his neck to stop. Ah, I wish I were you. Eh, I'm suffering here. Six months. I went for a course. And they put me in a hotel. When I opened the fridge in that room, my God. <laughs> Very cold Gouda. Star. He was sweating. <laughs> was sweating and then there's a packet of Ruthman's and matches <laughs> on top of the fridge conclude I sat with that subject. I did half before I got up I got back after that week I said you know what you have to take me as I am I started drinking again and I started smoking I said, oh, really? I said, yes. Yes. What are you going to do? He said, nothing. I got guilty the more. I thought she was going to fight so that we can fight it out. But she didn't fight. God knows how to fix you. I can talk forever. My wife can keep quiet forever. If I marry a talkative, there will be fire in the house. Because I call her, we want to discuss. By the time we finish, but you didn't say anything. I said, yes, you didn't allow me to say anything. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. I've not changed it tomorrow. But God is helping me. <laughs> I don't know how I got into that story. <laughs> but look at the lifestyle of Jesus. Okay, I was talking about you having your own kingdom, right? You see, his kingdom can't come until yours go. When you pray, your kingdom come, also whisper, my kingdom go. Your will be done on earth. This is the earth. My own will go. Because two captains can't steer a ship. He gives us a word in church when he says, your life is too small for you and I. Not enough space for you and I. One we have to just give way. When God comes, he doesn't come like a co-pilot. He comes to take charge. The day your car begins to talk back at you, we enter that car now and say, we are going back to Joseph. Say, no! We are going to Kano. Ah. <laughs> you will get down. You know that something terribly has gone wrong. <laughs> That's why Paul says, you are bought with a price. 
you are not your own. You see, church, we need to know that afresh. You don't own yourself. Somebody owns you. And you know this. The one who gives his life for you, paid for you. He has the right to take your life from you. This is how I summarize salvation. Jesus died, right? To give his life for you. So that he might take yours from you. That he might now live his own through you. You can't live your own. James said, how dare you plan? When you do that, you do it in arrogance. That truth dawned on me in 1995. That's when I stopped planning. I was a master strategist. I could plan 50 years ahead. My brain was, you know, optimum functioning. But 1995, I stopped planning when I discovered this truth. That God, you know, I think yours is going to be better for us. Your own plan. You know, that's the guarantee you are going to hear God. You don't need a sermon on how to hear God. The guarantee you are going to hear God is when you submit yourself absolutely to him. That was what Jesus Christ modeled. Look at, the, look, look at his core value. He said, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will. He had the will. But to do the will of him who sent me. And this blah, 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 this is the will. He now defined the will. But the key there is that he said, I came not to do. I can do whatever I want to do. Right? But I won't do it. You see, that's what makes you God. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. That is not because of incompetence. It's because of choice. Right? Everywhere I go and I say, you can do a lot without God. People, I said, yes. How many of you pray before you wore this shirt? Hmm? Did you pray, uh, Holy Spirit, please, what, what shirt should I wear this morning? Right? You wore that shirt, right? You can do a lot without God. The richest men on earth don't even know God. So when Jesus said this, it was out of choice, not out of incompetence. Hang on with me. This is the value system. This is the trait that's going to separate those of us in this company from those who are not. Because what's going to happen is you will see less of man on earth and more of God. That was what John said. He must increase. He must increase. But that is dependent on this. I must decrease. See, those things have disappeared from church. We have been swallowed up by our needs. And this is where I'm going to just give you the scripture. And you go and study it. He gave a sermon on the mount. And those be attitudes, because that's what they are, the attitudes to be. They are be attitudes. These are the attitudes to be. Are you with me? He gave, those are the essential traits of the citizens of God's kingdom. Right? And when he was going to do that, he spoke in parables to the people. And the Bible says he went up on the mountain. His disciples now came to him and he opened his mind and began to teach. Hallelujah. Verse 5 of that Matthew 5 is what catches my attention because of the way that tree ties to the earth. He said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What God wants to give you and I is this earth to manage. The earth is his. He's not relinquishing ownership, but he's relinquishing management. He wants only his thoughts, actions, intents to be seen on earth. But that can't happen except he find human vessels, human channels. So when you see a man of God come and he said, hey, we have the vessel of the Most High God here this morning, but... Those phrases were inherited from the fathers of the faith. But they lived in the reality of it. Today is just a way of deifying a man. A vessel, a channel, right? It's just a channel. What goes through it is more important than what, what the channel is, right? 
is meant to protect what grows, the content that goes through it, right? This is my paraphrase of Matthew 5 5. Blessed are those who understand the mystery of putting their gift of self determination in God's hands, for theirs is the earth to dominate. Because for as long as Adam was under God's dominion, he had dominion over the earth. Right? The moment he came out of that and did something of his own self, Adam will see a rat and run. The guy who named the lion. Right? That's why we now live in fear. <laughs> Are you guys following me? What's meekness? The word meek is a Greek word, prios. It means power under perfect control. You have power, but you put it in check. There's a product in Nigeria that added, you know, advertised like that, Bridgestone tires. They say power is nothing without control. That's what meek is. Meek is not being gentle. To be meek is to express the God-given ability to control one's strength. Now that's tough. A sign of maturity is that I can do this thing. But because of the revelation of a higher purpose, I choose not to. So God made man with a deliberate specific design that enabled man to live independently of God. That's why it's so easy for man to become God to himself. I always ask this question. Can God lie? Hmm? He can. God can lie. Hello, hello, yeah, good. We're still, we're still a how back. Tweak it a bit, brother. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know how far I'll go with this. The Newman Company are the ones who will establish the kingdom of God. And what that basically means is that they will choose not to establish their own kingdom. Right? Paul sang about this. Philippians. Two, five. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who though he was God, he did not demand his rights as God. He made himself. Nobody made him. That's why when God gave that command, he said, the day you eat of the fruit of this tree, you will die. He didn't say, I will kill you. Two different things. He said, listen to me, Christians. When you sin, God forgives, but sin can't help but punish. Right? That's why sin has consequences. Why? Because you chose to. You will have to live by the consequences of your sin. That's why David died the way he died. Somebody like David, a man after God's heart, should just walk right to heaven. Right? God forgave him, but the sin punished him. Are you guys with me? So we're talking here about God's kingdom. When we begin to talk kingdom, man is de-emphasized. God is emphasized. He said he was God, but he did not demand his rights as God. Church, today we are taught to demand our rights from God. God, you promised. According to your word, you are bound by your word. You must do it. That's how we pray to him. Not knowing that he's God. So the right that God has given us is what he's asking for back. And you know what? That right is only safe in his hands. He's looking for those who can say also that I can of my own self do nothing. Hallelujah. Let me see if there are other chiefs here. You see, Jesus Christ had the power. If he could raise the dead, right? If he could do all that, he could command the cross to disappear. Like a man wrote, you know, Michael Card, yes. He said it was not, it was Jesus that held the nails. It wasn't the nails that held Jesus there. Jesus held the nails on the cross. 
He was there by choice. That's why he told them, you guys are coming to me with swords and all these clubs and everything. Don't you know I can tell my father he will send me six legion of angels. And they will come and deliver me. Six legion is 72,000 angels. Those guys don't stand a chance. Right? If you know angels, one angel in the book of 1 Kings or 2 Kings killed 168,000 people in one night. It was just one unemployed angel who was just roaming around. He didn't know what. Hey, hey, hey. There's a problem there. And the guy went, 168,000 dead. And the guy, is there any other thing? <laughs> now imagine 72,000. <laughs> and this guy said, Are you Jesus? I am he. And they fell. So you see, he said, No man takes my life from me. I of my own chest, I lay it down. He chose to die. And that's the same pattern. So these kingdom builders are those who are aware of their tremendous power at their disposal to do whatever they want to do. But out of the knowledge and revelation of God's plan, they choose to surrender the power to God and come under his authority. That's why Paul called himself a bond servant. You understand that with their cultural heritage. A bond servant is actually called a bond slave. A born slave is a slave by choice. It's a slave that has, you know, worked out his 50 years. Right? Thank you for watching our entire video today. If you feel you can bless someone, please join us and spread the gospel by sharing this video on your social media.